Before I sort of get into the presentation, I'd also like to bring to the floor the fact that I'm actually a student of groundwater, I've been a student of groundwater who's kind of transitioned through many arenas. The formal education sector, the corporate sector for a couple of years, civil society NGOs, and now, of course, trying to talk to policy makers. And I still remain a student because every day is a new learning, particularly if you're Sort of, if, you're looking, if you have one sort of goal in mind, which is which is down. Uh, much of what I'm going to talk about in this presentation is also a consequence of almost a three to four year engagement, formal and informal, with a whole lot of people. Many of them are here. So for example, on the data and our early forays with the planning commission uh, was when Sundar Vijay Shankar from uh, Samaj Prakati Sahyog and I, we did a quick appraisal of India's groundwater in 2009 as a part of the end of the 11th plan. And a lot of, we were looking at a lot of data at that time, so much of this is also as a consequence of that work. Similarly, the, I think Sundar was also part of the working group on sustainable groundwater management, which I was chairing. And he was also a part of the data group. And I think so, so I would say Sundar is, is in a much better position to talk about data than I am. But I've taken the liberty of you know, learning from him and trying to build on those issues. So I sort of make those references as I go forward. Now, those are the reference points, and not necessarily in that order, but somewhere in the course of this presentation, I will try to cover those. I mean, if I look at if, if, if one were to define the problems around groundwater, then there's over-exploitation, contamination, there's always the reference to what is called the slipbacks in rural drinking water coverage. And of course, there's a very interesting, I would say, competition between users and users. And about a couple of months ago, somebody asked me, what about conflicts in groundwater? And I said, you know, from whatever I've learned, there are conflicts around surface water. But there are not necessarily conflicts around groundwater because there's there's quite a distance between you know between where people start feeling the competition and a competition leading to conflicts. Now the competition, of course, is about between competition between users, between different users. So we have millions of farmers. There's all sorts of industry coming around, old industry, new industry, there's urbanization, and there's, of course, household needs. So what does data information and edu education mean in context to all of these? So that's one question we should be asking. Uh, we all have talked about groundwater dependence, but let me sort of put it into sort of three broad boxes. Rural drinking water, almost entirely. <coughs> that debate is, interestingly, in the last two or three years, have been part of a debate which talks about whether it's 89 or 90 percent or whether it's 94 or 95 percent. So I don't think there's a debate at all around that. Agriculture, well, there are question marks before and after, but again, more or less 60, 70 percent of the total use. Urban, the latest report by uh, the CSE, which has studied something like 71 cities, Lithia. Uh, talks about something like 48% of total urban use coming out of groundwater. Now this actually talks of groundwater dependence. And I think that's that's what, uh, that's where India's story in groundwater is very unique. So it's a question about how do you understand, how does one understand the utilization, how much is the utilization, and how does one understand the assessment of what does this utilization mean in, in terms of mean, in terms of groundwater availability. This is a very unique picture I took a couple of months ago while touring the interiors of Vidarbha. This is from Bondia. This is the Nagzira Forest Sanctuary. And there's a massive water crisis in the Nagzira uh, Forest Sanctuary, uh, uh, Forest Reserve, where all the drinking water holes have dried up. So the forest department has actually bought tankers 
they've constructed a well, and you can actually see that there's a ramp going down to the well where even the big cats drink. So the big cats are also <laughs> drinking groundwater. So let me use the last chapter of Tushar's book and look at what are the sort of desirable changes in the quest for improved groundwater management. Uh, many of us talk about this, maybe we talk about this in different language. Um, <coughs> so there's of course the role of the sutra guru, the state. And how does this role need to change today? Going from almost a revenue collector role to the role of a, a more responsible role of dictating, mm -hmm. or not just dictating, but sort of influencing the whole groundwater management uh, system. Rewriting the mission statement of water managers. So managing water at more local scales is the sort of lesson that is, as I derive from what, what Tushar has written. Uh, I think Tushar alluded to the next part, the third bullet, which is the need for transformation. So there was a discussion in the earlier sort of session, at the end of Tushar's session, which talked about this, what does it mean in terms of hard rock and what does it mean in terms of alluvial aquifer. So he says that there's rivalrous gaming, which is actually happening in hard rock aquifers, and it should go into some kind of a cooperative game. Similarly, the there is need to sort of rein in the collusive, collusive opportunism in the alluvial systems of India. So you know those kinds of transitions. The fourth point is redesigning water governance. Redesigning water governance, not just in terms of what happens as governance centrally, but also what happens at the level of the small holder. So there's this big, I would say there's the big, there's a big recharge push. There's also the there's also a pull. You know, people want more and more recharge. But at the same time, I would say that it's much, it's quite easy to service that pull with the kind of push we are talking about. And at the same time, it, when one tries to look at governance, one also needs to look beyond recharge if one is talking of sort of decentralized government. The, 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 the final point is really about new forms of partnership, which is what we were talking about. And then building governance or sort of taking governance and building it on whatever Swayambhu institutions. But I think there's also this reference to institutions. And there's a lot of debate on how the institutions should be, how we should structure them. And I kind of agree with Tushar that why can we, can we not build on existing institutions which function? Now the reason why I say this, why I sort of listed these now, is because a couple of years ago, we were looking at, you know, at the broad topics that deal with groundwater in current curricula, in almost the top 16, 17 institutions in the countries, uh, in the country, which run about 30, 35 courses related to groundwater. And you can see that there's fluid dyna dynamics, there's water quality, there's groundwater management as a section, and there's, there are sections, there's a section called groundwater problems. At the same time, we, because we were part of this groundwater management exercise and experiment, and we were looking at various, uh, you know, initiatives, ranging from AP farms to what Yogesh is doing in Kutch, to, you know, smaller initiatives, working through drillers, that some of us have been working. And we actually <coughs> pulled out four boxes, which are the inputs that these groundwater management practitioners require or were articulating to us that these are the inputs that we require in our work. And somewhere there's actually a mismatch. So the mismatch is not just in the titles, the mismatch is also in how these courses are detailed on. And if we therefore sort of go back and look at, at this list, I think we can come up with almost a formal system of curriculum which, which completely rethinks the subject of groundwater. So I think the first point I want to make is how do we need to bring about that change? Now, when we look at data as a game changer, I think when we look at data as a game changer, to me the most important factor with data is the scale of data. And because we have such a diverse range of scales in groundwater, so whether we come at it from a very sociological uh, analysis or whether we come at it from a hydrogeological analysis, the scale and diversity are a very interesting match. And I think we must 
looked at data as a game changer in the scale and diversity map. And just to illustrate the point, let me give you an example of how I look at data. You have two boreholes, which are 10 meters apart. <coughs> now, for all practical purposes, one might be inclined to assume that these two boreholes are tapping the same aquifer. <coughs> in fact, a lot of monitoring of water levels might not get you the answer that they are different aquifers. When you look at these borewells from an aquifer perspective, you actually see that if you monitor them properly, they have two different sets of water levels. <coughs> the water levels in these two sets of borewells are almost 55 meters apart. <coughs> and the reason is they tap two different aquifers. The water quality in these two, two borewells is also quite different. And therefore, the sort of revisiting <coughs> aquifer based thinking on <coughs> groundwater is simply because if you want to look at data, you need a reference point which is scientific and a reference point which is practical. And unless you have that reference point, data will not become a game changer. So my second argument is I think if we link back in whatever way we work, whether we work at the advocacy level, whether we work at a practitioner's level, if we have that reference between data and aquifer, it makes things all the more sort of, I would say, productive. It makes the forward linkage far more productive. During the course of our work, and this is this is essentially Sundar's idea, so let me sort of credit him with that. We tried to combine the Central Groundwater Board's quantitative data you know, on groundwater exploitation, on the sort of national groundwater assessment, and we combined it with quality. And what we got is a very interesting mosaic. The colors represent different shades of exploitation. The hatchering represents the seriousness of groundwater quality problems. Now, when you have this a map of this combination, you're almost looking at 60% vulnerability to groundwater resources. Much of it can be attributed to the kind of problem that Tushar alluded to or Yogesh alluded to at different scales. Now, let me also pick one block or one, one, one block from a district from this map, which is that, and go down to the scale of aquifers or go down to the scale of even I would say micro volumes and use the same methodology of assessment that the Central Groundwater Board uses. And we come up with, forget the sort of geological map behind, but look at the gray, blue, yellow, and the red shapes. And you'll find that it's very different from the gross block level assessment we have at the end. And I think this is again something that we need to revisit because the strategies of groundwater management at this scale might be different from the policy level strategies that are proposed at a much, much more regional scale. I mean, another sort of, another uh, thought that, that sort of comes to mind is, if you look at energy, for example, and if you look at using energy as an instrument, even in an area like this, we might need to think a little more smartly uh, on, on how energy can be brought in as a sort of broad-based layer of groundwater management. Okay, now the next two slides are just a, a sense of giving, giving you some idea about the diversity and scale that I'm talking about. Uh, this, these are, I call them nomograms, which are sort of typical of spring uh, discharges in the Himalayan region. So in the last five or six years, we've also had the opportunity to work on groundwater resources in the mountainous regions, which still is quite a gray area because the assessment itself does not include assessment of groundwater resources in large parts of the Himalayan states. Now, these are four <coughs> springs, and this is typical spring behavior. Now, there's also this big push for recharge in the Himalayan states, so recharge of springs. How do you strategize recharge in the case of a perennial high discharge spring versus a seasonal low discharge spring? This is where the whole strategy of hydrogeology, social engineering can be perceived. That you need different strategies. This is, this is going far back to my days as a, as a PhD student in working on a basalt aquifer for almost 15 years. These are four wells in one single aquifer. 
So a single aquifer like a basalt, or a single aquifer in a basalt, can actually have very diverse transmission and storage characteristics. And you need to sort of deal with that, that diversity of that scale. So that's just to throw up the thing. Now, let me end my thinking by, so there's one more slide after this, by combining my concept of groundwater exploitation or an exploitation of a shallow aquifer with, uh, with what Tushar has given in his book in terms of the four stages, the four ecological stages of how groundwater is extracted. So, you know, as water levels fall, you obviously there's a correlation in time between the fall in water levels, between sort of the overall abstraction that gains a high and then sort of flattens out, the pump density, how it goes up and then again flattens down, the amount of pump irrigation that's sold in the form of water markets, and of course the size of the agrarian economy. So therefore, an aquifer also has some kind of a timeline. Now, this is something which, which probably doesn't figure in mainstream irrigation. So as a hydrogeologist, I really was never taught about pump density, what is the meaning of groundwater markets, what's the whole question of an agrarian economy, what are agricultural productivities <coughs> and so on and so forth. So I think we need to bring all of these elements back into our education and knowledge systems in order to understand groundwater management. The water da database itself as it stands today must deal with some kind of a convergence. So this is again something that uh, a, a colleague, uh, Vivek Kale, who was also part of the working group on, on, on water data, uh, came up with. So I think you know there are different agencies which are different, which which are sort of dealing with different kinds of data, and much of this data also has a groundwater element in it. How can we put all of this together? There's geospatial data which is diverse but which is necessary. So groundwater data today is no longer about assessing the availability alone, but also about managing resource and how do we put it together. Let me leave you with this slide, where I've tried to almost do a match of the audiences and the use of data, knowledge, and skills. So to me, I mean, looking at considering the downwater dependence, it's almost every citizen in this country who becomes a stakeholder. There are academic and research institutions which have a major role to play, especially in making that major shift in basic and higher education. There are the state and central agencies which I think still have a semblance of that development syndrome at the back of their minds and which need to also take on a, a, a more management approach. I would say it's, it's coming about, but I think that's, that's where some more work needs to be done. And then there are the sort of formal and informal planners and managers. So for instance, to me, I would put the PhD department in many states to be a manager of government. Because they are the ones who actually do, on a, on a daily basis, deal with the sort of drinking water supply in, in the villages of India. So how do, does one bring about a change in their, in their sort of skills, in their knowledge, and so on and so forth? On this side, I've also put down some kind of a, almost a wish list of what, what could be done. So if we go by, say, a population of 30 million wells, and if you look at an investment of one time data from let's say even 30% of this wells which is 10 million wells. We actually have a database which not, not, might not be dynamic, but we have a database which no other country in the world has. So how do we convert that challenge of 30 million wells into an opportunity for data? The second one is about education and research. So break away from convention, include skills include more of skills in formal education, demystify science, do it at different levels. We break out of the drilling and construction syndrome. And I think we probably, I think that the sort of last point in my presentation is that I think the biggest challenge we're gonna have is how do we make sure that this, there's a continuity of work <coughs> on groundwater. Right now, it still is a target-driven process. It's 
it, it, it needs you know a con constant upgradation of approaches of knowledge and skills and how do we build that continuity in this into this whole world?